Um, so next we have uh, Dave, David Silver with us. Um, most of you will probably know Dave already. He doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. So after graduating from Cambridge, uh, Dave co-founded Elixir Studios, a video game company where he was uh, CTO. Later, he returned to academia to study reinforcement learning at the University of Alberta with uh, Rich Sutton and joined full-time DeepMind in 2013, where he, was, he has led or contributed to some of the most exciting projects in the company, from uh, AlphaGo to AlphaStar, AlphaFold, and MuZero. On a, I guess on a more personal note, Dave was actually my professor at UCL, where he, he taught me reinforcement learning, introducing me to the field, and getting me to, to, to actually love reinforcement learning. So and I also had the pleasure of working him with him in the past five years at DeepMind, where he has been a constant source of inspiration. So I'm really excited today to uh, give the give the the floor to Dave, who will be presenting an, an ambitious view of reinforcement learning in his talk. Carol is enough. Okay. Thanks so much, Matteo. It's really really kind intro. Um, I wanted to give a slightly um, different talk today, which is um, not one I've actually given before to uh, um, uh, an audience like this. So I hope um, hope you find it interesting. And it's really about um, stepping back from the details of the machine learning that we really do day to day and trying to ask, you know, what problem should we actually try and solve? Um, so there are many, many problem formulations that are out there. Um, some of the familiar ones are things like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and so forth. But what should we follow? What if we really want to solve AI in a big sense? You know, really looking forward to the future and the coming decades, and really make a lot of progress. What's the right problem for us to study? Um, and I want to at least hypothesize that the problem of maximizing reward might be enough um, to take us a really long way towards all the things that we mean by by AI. Um, so this is actually joint work with Satinder Singh, Doina Precup, and Rich Sutton, but I'll take the liberty of making all the mistakes on, on their behalf. Um, and let me just plow ahead then by giving a brief introduction to the main ideas, and then we can sort of delve into it into slightly more detail. So, you know, we really should ask big questions as, as um, scientists who are interested in, in intelligence. I mean, this is really intelligence itself is really one of the fundamental questions of, of science um, over decades and centuries, really. Um, and it's come up both in natural intelligence, but how do we understand animal intelligence, human intelligence, the existing intelligences which are, which are out there, and artificial intelligence. So how do we implement a new intelligence? How do we construct intelligence? Um, and so in the study of intelligence, Many people have identified different attributes of intelligence and studied these things, and there's an awful lot that's been understood and, and identified about these various different attributes. And by attributes of intelligence, I'll, I mean things like knowledge or social intelligence or language or perception, imagination, motor control, generalization, common sense, memory, attention, um, many, many more. And, and really, I think the question I want you to think about is, you know, what, what actually drives an agent, like an animal or human or one of our artificial agents, to exhibit such diverse expressions of intelligence? Like, how can it be that the same animal both has knowledge and social intelligence and language and perception and imagination and so forth? Uh, is there any way we can understand this rich diversity of expressions of intelligence? And not only how can we understand them, but if we can understand them, then consequently, how could we in future perhaps construct these attributes in our artificial agents? So we've talked about these different attributes and I think the way these have been understood historically has largely been thinking of them as distinct um, pieces of intelligence that have their own, their own goals. And each attribute of intelligence has some goal that is elicited, designed specifically to elicit that attribute. And that you can think of as a, a special problem formulation just for, for that particular attribute of intelligence. And so the traditional approach to AI has been to break up AI into kind of like, you know, one field for each attribute of intelligence. So if you study perception, then you might study perception and, and drive the, the development of, of, um, of an attribute of perception by 
a goal of object recognition or classification. And if you're studying language, you might drive the, um, the development of language by um, historically by, by a, a variety of different goals, such as parsing or tagging or sentiment analysis. Or more recently, if you look at, for example, GPT-3 and work by OpenAI, you know, those, those things have been unified into, a, into driving language by a goal of next word prediction. And that gives rise to, to many other things within language. Or if you wanted to study social intelligence, the, the understanding of social intelligence, like how different agents interact with each other, has largely been formulated um, by a goal, by the pursuit of, of trying to find a Nash equilibrium between um, agents that interact with each other. And that's how people have traditionally tried to understand, you know, what does it mean for, for agents to, to um, build an intelligence in which they can understand each other. And so that's kind of the, the traditional approach, separate attributes with separate goals. Um, so, but if we think about goals, like, you know, these, these are very specific goals that were designed to elicit one particular attribute of intelligence. But more generally, you know, we might want our intelligence to pursue a huge variety of, of, of goals, which are just whatever, whatever that particular animal or, or, or agent actually is required to do to, to achieve its, its, its aims. So an animal might act to minimize hunger, a kitchen robot might act to maximize cleanliness. The Go playing agent might act to maximize winds. Um, there are you know, thousands of possible um, goals that one might um, imagine our agents being asked to do because that's the useful thing that, that, that we require our agent to do. Or in the natural world, there are thousands of different things which our animals just find themselves needing to do in order to, to survive or, or, or reproduce or, or whatever it is. So, so this is a very different view. It's, it's, it's saying, you know, the, the problem is, is, is just to solve whatever it is that, the, that we, we need the agent to do. Um, and in trying to understand those goals, we, we may use rewards. Rewards provide a very flexible representation of goals. We'll talk about this later, perhaps even all goals, some might argue. And so the question then is, could the pursuit of reward, could the pursuit of, of whatever this goal is, whatever it is we're directly wanting, uh, whatever the agent actually just needs to do, it's overarching goal, it's, it's um, overarching aim, could the pursuit of that reward in itself be enough to understand intelligence? Do we need these separate um, goals to elicit these separate frameworks and these separate problem formulations? Or could everything just fall out of this, this one overall understanding of, of pursuing reward? And so that's what this talk is about. It's about saying, well, you know, you could have many attributes with a, with a common goal. And the common goal is just to maximize reward, like whatever it is that the agent is being asked to do, you know, whether it's to, um, um, to collect as many nuts as possible if it's a squirrel or to, to make the kitchen as clean as possible if it's a kitchen robot or to win as many games if it's a go-playing um, bot. You know, that's what we want our agent to do and maybe um, all of these different attributes of intelligence can be understood in the light of achieving that goal. So how can this be? This seems like kind of um, counterintuitive. We've just started off by saying there's this huge diversity of different attributes of intelligence that are out there in the, in the animal kingdom and in, in human intelligence. How can all of those different things be explained by this kind of one naive, rather simple signal and just maximizing it? And the answer is that it's because the environment itself is immensely complex. And a complex environment demands many attributes of intelligence in order to maximize that simple signal. So you know, if you are in a complicated world, then you need to have perception, you need to have language, you need to have social intelligence in order to survive or achieve whatever your, your, um, your aim is. And so reward maximization can be viewed as, as a kind of common goal um, that emerges like all of these attributes um, of intelligence um, the argument is that they, they emerge in the pursuit of reward maximization. Um, and the world is just so complex that it demands many such attributes in order to maximize even very simple rewards like survival, hunger, thirst, pain, or whatever it is. So, you know, that's the hypothesis that reward maximization may be sufficient to understand intelligence, to explain all of these diverse expressions of intelligence in natural intelligence, and maybe even more importantly, to allow us to implement a similarly diverse array of attributes of intelligence um, in artificial intelligence, if we do this right. Okay, so let's just call this out with a couple of examples. Um, 
So let's think about a squirrel. So you know, let's say you have some squirrel and it's trying to achieve a very simple goal like to um, not be hungry. So it's trying to maximize its goal. Its, its, its reward is, is something like minus hunger. Um, and it's just trying to maximize that, that signal. Um, so how can we understand all of the things that the squirrel does? Well, maybe we can understand them in the light of this common goal simply because a squirrel um, actually it's, its environment that the squirrel is in demands all of these different things. For example, it demands perception, like it needs to know whether an acorn is good or bad and you know, uh, small or large and, and which oak trees contain acorns and which don't. Uh, it demands knowledge to understand all of these different uh, things about, about nuts and where they're found and, and, um, and the life cycle of trees and so forth. Uh, it demands motor control to be able to manipulate and collect these acorns. It demands planning to choose where to hide its acorns so that um, um, and, and, and um, social intelligence to bluff other squirrels to make sure that, that they're not going to discover this cache of acorns that's hidden and memory to remember where it's where it's hidden these things so it can come back to them after the winter and, and recover its during the winter and recover its, its cache of, of hidden acorns. So you know, all of these things can be understood in the light of, of maximizing reward. We don't need separate problem definitions with separate goals to, to study and, and, and understand them. Um, now let's do an example from artificial intelligence. So let's think about a kitchen robot. Um, and, and the same story can be true there. Like let's say we ask our kitchen robot to maximize something like cleanliness. Um, well, that would demand perception to differentiate clean and dirty utensils and knowledge to understand the different types of utensil and motor control to be able to manipulate all these things and memory to remember where they've all been placed and language to be able to listen to the conversations that are going on in the kitchen and predict um, what mess is going to occur and um, who's about to be cooking and who's about to be leaving the room. And social intelligence maybe to encourage children to make less mess, good luck with that one, um, and so forth. So we kind of end up with something like this picture where we have this interaction between you know, the agent and the environment where the agent is kind of interacting, it's taking its actions, it's getting kind of these rewards which tell it, you know, the squirrel how many, how many acorns it's getting, or it's telling this kitchen robot how, how clean it's, it's, it's making things. And it's just trying to maximize that one signal. Um, but the expression of that maximization over a lifetime of trying to, um, of doing well, of, of succeeding in maximizing that signal, um, if the squirrel is able to maximize that signal or the kitchen robot is able to maximize its cleanliness, that the ex expression that we see um, expressed within its experience, within this trajectory that those, those um, agents actually produce, we should see expressions of many, many different attributes of intelligence. Um, and, and that's kind of the hypothesis that we're exploring here, that, that essentially all of these things just kind of fall out of of the interaction between an agent that's maximizing its reward in a rich environment. Okay, so are there advantages to thinking this way? Um, well, I think there are, that if we uh, think about a common goal rather than separate problem formulations for separate attributes of intelligence, it gives us a deeper understanding of those attributes of intelligence because it explains why each attribute is actually important in the first place. And you don't get at that point if you kind of predefine um, you know, your perception to be about object recognition. It doesn't tell you why object recognition is important in the first place or how much um, um, capacity should be allocated to that thing rather than something else. It also gives a broader understanding. So it actually covers richer forms of each attribute than you might access if you define a specific problem formulation for that thing. So an example of that might be, you know, perception that now, let's say you want to formulate perception. Well, maybe you could do it as object recognition via classification in supervised learning. And that would give you a rich set of, of perception attributes, but it would miss a whole load of things. It would miss, for example, the idea of perception as being something active, uh, uh, active like in haptics, like you know, uh, putting my hand into my pocket and identifying whether there's a sharp object in my pocket. That's something which is not really about um, traditional um, object recognition because it's active. You have to move your fingertips around within your pocket and identify the sharp edges. And at the end of that, have some idea of what's going on. Um, or similarly, grounding in language. You might have um, um, a dialogue between agents discussing um, a, a, an awkward object to carry. 
or you might have irrational agents in social intelligence and, and Nash equilibrium might not be a good model of what those irrational agents actually do. Um, so a common goal, you know, really gives you this, this breadth that kind of lets you understand whatever the environment demands you to understand. It also gives an integrated understanding and implementation. So if you have a separate goal for each of these attributes of intelligence, as has traditionally been proposed in AI, um, the integration of the pieces is, is a really thorny outstanding issue that we just don't know how to deal with. Whereas the common goal sort of tells you how these things fit together because we've started from the top with the overarching goal of, of, of maximizing the end goal of, of the system. So let's take an example which I'm familiar with, so working on Computer Go. Um, you know, a lot of people before things like AlphaGo came along, they, they, they thought about Computer Go in this way. They thought, well, there's a whole load of attributes of intelligence that are required to play the game of Go, things like um, understanding shape, that's kind of like, was, and that was formulated as like a pattern recognition problem. Um, there were problems of tactics that was formulated as a local search problem. There are problems of um, telling the end game theory, which was formulated as um, you know, really beautiful ideas like combinatorial game theory. Um, and AlphaGo kind of threw out those separate views of things and said, let's just focus directly on the common goal, the common goal of maximizing games. Like, let's just focus on the problem of reward maximization. Like, what do we really want to achieve? That's the end goal. Let's set ourselves um, a task of, of maximizing rewards, um, use that as a common goal. And that common goal actually led to a deeper understanding of shape and tactics and end games um, than people have been able to actually get to um, in prior work that had focused specifically on each of those things in, in isolation. And it also produced a broader set of attributes. You know, these kind of fuzzier ideas which Go players talk about, ideas like territory and influence, thickness and lightness, attack and defense, um, but which were hard to formalize and people hadn't really been able to access as kind of um, um, formal concepts and, 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 and therefore hadn't really been studied or, or developed in, in great depth by, by AI. And furthermore, this came integrated into a unified intelligence that actually was able to win games. Um, and it turns out that in prior work that had actually been very hard to kind of put the pieces together in any meaningful way. So, okay, that was just Go. And of course, the real world is far more complex than Go. Um, and the attributes of intelligence within, within Go are really you know, limited in scope. But maybe the same ideas will still apply, that the maximization of simple rewards in much richer environments could produce even broader and richer attributes of intelligence, and maybe even all attributes of intelligence. And that's the hypothesis, which I think it's interesting to explore. OK. So let's take that hypothesis seriously and just try and spell it out for a second. And um, we call this the reward is enough hypothesis. And it basically says that all attributes of intelligence can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward by an agent acting in its environment. It's really saying you know, reward is enough and spelling it out by saying um, we have some agent acting in its environment. That's this kind of cycle of interaction. Um, and the only thing we need to understand all of these different attributes of intelligence that, that emerge um, uh, is, is, to, is, is for the agent to focus on the maximization of reward. And everything will just drop out of that, of that single, single way of thinking. OK, now there's another sentence here, which is to say, you know, moreover, this is true for many simple rewards in many environments. This is not like a kind of artificial hypothesis saying, oh, we're just going to create the one perfect environment with the one perfect reward signal that kind of allows this particular attribute of intelligence or even all attributes of intelligence to, to emerge. No, this is saying, you know, whatever, this, whatever the reward signals are, like the hunger or the thirst or the cleanliness or the, um, the click through or whatever the things are we're asking our agents to do and which we want them to do, um, it, it's these things that it should be true for in the environments that we really care about. And so, so it's really a pragmatic statement that, that all we need to do is to maximize the reward signals that, that, we, that matter in the environments that matter. And if we do that well enough, um, that all of the attributes of intelligence will, will fall out. OK, so it's a bold hypothesis. I'm sure many of you are sitting there going, what? This is crazy. How can you be saying this? And I hope we'll have a lively discussion shortly. OK. 
So I just wanted to dive in next into you know, how this leads then to the, to the reinforcement learning problem. So I know you've already had, a, I think, a, a lecture today on, on BRL problems. So, um, so hopefully this will all be familiar. Um, and really what I want to do is, is to just kind of you know, motivate the RL problem and say, you know, there's a reason why we study it and why this is with why this is so important to think about. And, and the reason is that reinforcement learning defines the problem of reward maximization. So RL is, is really, it's a problem definition. It's, it's, it, it is the formal definition of the problem of reward maximization. It's not about the solution method. Of course, there are solution methods for RL, but this whole talk and this whole premise of um, reward is enough is completely agnostic to the solution method. It's saying, you know, let's just ask the question, what problem should we should we try and address? And then, you know, we may not have the solutions now. This isn't about the solutions we have right now. Those solutions may be way off the, the, the final ones that we actually need to elicit all of these attributes of intelligence. But it's saying, you know, let's think about the problem that we really need to solve if we want to maximize reward. And through that, through this hypothesis, um, um, see if that will actually bring about all of these different aspects of intelligence. Okay, so RL is the problem definition for reward maximization. Um, in the following sense, it's, it's a very general definition of reward maximization in that it covers many instances that could be faced by intelligence, like many environments, many goals, and some might even argue all instances, but I think, you know, we don't really need to go there. You know, the point is really just that it's extremely general. And furthermore, that it's very practical in the sense that you know, RL actually um, directly addresses the real problem faced by an agent, um, um, whether it's an, a natural agent or an artificial agent, not an abstraction of the problem. Um, it's, it's you know, really trying to access the real thing. Um, so, so briefly, let's just um, recap what this RL problem definition is. So that's just, this is essentially the one slide. Um, it's saying there's an agent and there's an environment. Um, and the decision-making problem, we think about it as being decoupled into a problem, which is the environment, and a solution, which is the agent. And these kind of things talk to each other step by step. So the agent takes an action, AT at every step, and the environment responds with some observation at every step. Um, and the agent is, is this system that outputs the next action, given the experience it's seen so far, like the sequence of actions and observations to date. Um, so that's this thing. And the environment is the converse system that outputs observations given the, the experience that it's seen of, of actions and observations that have been um, get, happening so far. Um, so that's the RL problem definition, very simple. Hopefully you're familiar with that from, from today's um, 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 lectures. And, you know, let's, let's think about the parts of that. So, so the, on the agent side, as I mentioned, RL really addresses the practical problem that's faced by, uh, by these agents. Um, in the following sense, that the agent is, is really bounded. It's bounded by practical constraints. So the agent has um, limited capacity, and that limits um, the limits on its capacity are determined by its, like, how it's made, its machinery. So if you think of the, the agent as being a brain, it might have limited neurons. Um, and if you think of it as a computer, it might have li limited memory. Um, and again, the agent runs in real time. So, so if it's a brain, the synapses might take time to fire. And if it's a computer, the CPU or whatever might take time to, to process. And the environment's just going to continue ticking in the meanwhile while the agent executes. So, so these bounds are really important that when we say we're trying to solve the, um, the reward maximization problem, this is the reward maximization problem subject to these constraints. You know, we're really trying to find the best agent within these constraints that, the, that this thing is going to operate in real time and the environment's going to carry on ticking. And, and that there is some limit on what you can actually do within this. Um, you can't have an infinitely complex uh, brain. And the environment definition in RL um, is really, I, I just want to step back and just appreciate the beauty of the environment definition. Um, and that it's, it's incredibly general. Um, it really allows for just you know, a vast range of, of, of um, different problems to be expressed. Um, so you know, the observations can be discrete or continuous, as can the actions, as can time. Um, the dynamics can be deterministic or stochastic. The observability of the problem can be fully observed or partially observed. The agents, you can have single agent or multi-agent. Um, and in this sense, note that you know, by multi-agent here, you know, the other agents we can just think of as part of that single agent's world, like what the other agents do, that's just part of the environment. Um, uncertainty, we can allow for 
for um, certain or uncertain environments. We can have um, continuing environments, or we can have episodic environments that, that, that terminate and, and then reset back at the beginning again, um, or ones that just go on forever. Um, we can have stationary environments or non-stationary environments that really depend on the history of what's, what's happened so far. In fact, in, for the definition I gave, that's really just the normal thing. We can have asynchronous um, or synchronous environments, um, and we can have simulated environments, or the environment can be the real world, including humans within it. Um, and, and that's all just part of this definition of environment. And we didn't need to change anything from this, this slide that we had here. Okay, so it's, so it's very, very broad, and we should appreciate that that's a powerful thing, and we should be very re reluctant to let go of that generality. Um, similarly, the, the rewards that we have in RL, so, so we try and capture this notion of goal. Like goal is really the essence of intelligence. Intelligence is about having a, a goal-seeking behavior. And, and, and the maximization of cumulative reward allows us to represent a huge variety of goals. Um, and so you know, let me just say this by example, that, that the kind of goals we can represent with cumulative reward are things like survival, reproduction, hunger, thirst, or you know, if you were doing online metrics, it could be money or click through or watch time or lifetime value um, or physical metrics for a, a um, physical system might be things like energy or production or time or battery. And you might get human feedback as your metric, things like thumbs up or looking at someone's face to see if they're smiling or giving them a questionnaire or plugging directly into their brain and checking their dopamine to see how happy they are. You know, these are all all part of the same problem definition and just perfectly legitimate choices of reward. And some might even argue that all goals can be represented as, as maximization of cumulative reward. Indeed, there's a, another hypothesis, which maybe confusingly is called the reward hypothesis, that speculates that all goals can be usefully represented by rewards. Um, I don't think we need to go there. The point here is, is simply that this, this is, is a very, very general representation that covers a huge set of problems that we, that we real problems that we might actually care about. And importantly, the rewards provide intermediate feedback at every step. So this is really crucial that you, you just have to have this because you might want it to have agents that deal with environments um, in which termination never occurs um, or, or occurs only after you know, years of, of operation. And, and you need to have some kind of meaningful feedback at the intermediate time steps to be able to do things like learning. Um, okay. So that's really, you know, why, why RL? And I think it's just useful to have that in mind. You've just had this lesson de defining RL. And I think sometimes it's good to step back and say, well, you know, why the heck should we study this problem rather than another problem? Or why is it being done in this way? Or why shouldn't I just change it um, to make my own version of the RL problem to specialize it or change the, the setup in some way? And, and I think, you know, we want to preserve this generality and power. Okay. So, so I think I'm going to carry on for a few more minutes, if that's okay, and just to try and get these these next bits, um, you know, really get some some insight into some of the what reward is enough is really helping us to to understand, and, and to do that, I think it's really important to sort of challenge the hypothesis. So again, we made this you know very strong hypothesis that that all attributes of intelligence can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward, um, and and so let's challenge that and ask ask this for you know, some attributes of intelligence that might seem really hard for RL to access and see if, if, if maximization of reward could conceivably give rise to, um, to an understanding of, of those attributes of intelligence. Um, so, so I think a really good one to start with is, is um, knowledge and learning, right? learning itself. Right? Note that you know, we, we really just defined a problem agnostic to any aspect of the algorithm, including whether or not it learns or whether or not it contains prior knowledge or how much prior knowledge was contained within the agent. You know, we really just defined a problem and said nothing about the, the solution. Um, just as the supervised learning problem doesn't say anything about the, the fact that you need to do learning in order to minimize your classification error. Um, so, so what about knowledge and learning then? Can we, can we try and gain understanding into these really key attributes of intelligence um, purely through reward maximization. Um, and I think, I think the idea would be to say, well, yeah, that, that there are environments which really demand prior knowledge. So there are these environments. There are environments like, you know, you think about a gazelle or something, and the gazelle, it might be born, 
Um, and it might have to be able to run really quickly after it's born in order to avoid a, a predator like a lion. Um, and, and so it, it, it just has to have prior knowledge. It's demanded by the environment. Otherwise, that gazelle is going to be eaten. Um, but also note that the amount of prior knowledge that you can put into the gazelle um, is limited by, by the agent's capacity. Like the brain can only uh, fit so much prior knowledge in there. Um, and it's really hard to construct that prior knowledge in advance of actually having any experience of, the, of, of, of its lifetime. Um, now, it's also the case that some environments demand learning. They demand learned knowledge. So why is that? How does that arise from this kind of reward is enough view? And it arises naturally because the future is uncertain. It's uncertain in many ways. Like the, the world might be unknown. It might be stochastic. It might be immensely complex. And because of these things, um, there's this vast space of possible future trajectories that the agent might find itself in. And it doesn't know in advance which of those trajectories it's going to be in. You know, it might think of a human. It might be that human brain. It might find itself in a life where, where it's born into the Arctic or it might find itself um, born into, into um, the savanna um, and in Africa. And, 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 and the set of potential knowledge that's actually required in order to deal with those that exponentially vast set of trajectories is massively greater than the capacity of the agent. So, you know, it might be born into a world where it needs to, you know, understand how to, you know, traverse over glaciers, or it might be it has to cross over savannah. It might need, it has to build ice, um, or it might have to build with mud. It might have to fight with polar bears. It might have to fight with lions. It might have to speak in different languages or become a farmer or a hunter or, or face locusts or plague or war or hurricane or go blind or deaf or make friend or foe. Um, and it's too much for the agent to be able to know in advance how to deal with the exponential set of all possible circumstances that might have to face. Instead, if, if that set of potential knowledge is outstrips the capacity of the agent because of the bounds on the agent, then the knowledge must adapt. It must have learning in order to adapt to circumstance. And, and so how do these things trade off on each other? Well, we might need prior knowledge and we might need learned knowledge, but as our agents face longer lives and more complex environments, learned knowledge will become increasingly important. Um, so the role that prior knowledge has to play will become relatively less and less. Um, as we have bigger and bigger worlds with longer and longer lifetimes, this space of potential knowledge that they need to know about will become vast and, and, and the agents will just have to learn. Um, so it just kind of falls out of, of, of you know, reward is enough and uh, it demands, learning is demanded as is, as is prior knowledge. Um, Okay, what about perception? Like perception seems to be, you know, the, the greatest success story of, of, of AI to date. Um, and, 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 you know, is it really the case that we're going to throw out the traditional approach to perception and, and, and replace it with, with something different? Isn't that, isn't that crazy to kind of give up on the, the biggest successes of, of, that we have under our belts? Well, you know, let's think about it. You know, rich real world environments, they really do demand a whole range of perceptual skills. Like, you know, they really demand things like image segmentation. Right? Otherwise, you might fall off a cliff if you can't tell the, where the cliff ends and the, and the sky begins. Um, you know, real world environments really demand object recognition. Like if you can't tell the difference between a, a, a healthy food and a poisonous food, you're, you're, you're gonna die. Um, and you might need face recognition to tell the difference between a friend and a foe, otherwise you might um, get shot. And you might need scene parsing in order to know, you know which objects are actually important in, 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 in the situation you're in. Um, and you might need speech recognition to understand verbal warnings, avoid negative consequences, et cetera. Um, so RL, the RL pr problem, you know, this reward maximization demands, demands you know, really rich variety of perceptual tasks. And, and so, yeah, we can go down the, the, the world of, of treating these things separately, of having like a different problem formulation for each of these things, but we can alternatively view to, um, perception as following, a, as being elicited from a, a subserving a common goal of reward maximization. Um, and that might allow us to access a much richer variety of perceptual tasks where there's no labeled data, where action and observation are intertwined, like the um, sharp object in the pocket example, uh, the utility of, of perception might be policy dependent, like it's, you know, might be much more important to classify a crocodile when you're swimming than it is when you're walking. Um, I mean, it might be cost to perception um, and the distribution of the data might really 
change depending on whether you're you know, born into um, the Arctic or, or Africa. Like all these things are, are much richer versions of perception than we normally access when we treat perception as pure classification, as pure, uh, pure supervised learning. And that's important. We need, to, we, need to, we need to get there. We need to go there. Um, OK, what about social intelligence? So normally people think of social intelligence as, as maximizing this kind of as solving this joint system where you've got all of these different agents um, and, 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 and we think of it as social intelligence as the equilibrium of multi-agent game. It's the game theory approach, which has been standard, you know, John Nash um, and, and, and so forth. Um, and it takes the perspective of all agents. And, and it's, it's really popular because it, it provides this like robust view that kind of we, we feel like we're gaining, gaining something because we're providing our agents with this ability to be robust to the worst case of what, of what the opponent might do um, or the other agent might do. But these things can also be viewed by, uh, arise from treating other agents as part of the environment and, um, and viewing social intelligence as subserving the maximization of the reward from a single agent's point of view. You know, these other agents, just like the squirrel, you know, there might be other agents in its environment and it just has to do the right thing with its, with its acorns um, such that it, it fools those other agents. Um, it doesn't need to understand the concept of Nash. It can do this purely from its own perspective. And if those other agents are adapting to, to, what, to what I'm doing, well, I need to um, do better in order to outwit those agents that are adapting to me. But the very fact that they're adapting is just part of what they're doing within, their, within my environment. So the environment may be very, very complex. Other agents may be part of it. And, um, and, and if those agents are adapting as part of that environment, yeah, it makes the environment rich and complicated. But all I need to do is to understand how to do well in that rich and complicated and adaptive environment in order to maximize reward. And that is sufficient in order to, for, for, um, for all the attributes of social intelligence that we require to emerge. OK, I've just got a couple more slides. So language. Um, so language is, is, is a beautiful example because, you know, historically people viewed language as, as coming from, you know, all these different bits and pieces. There were like 20, 30, 40 different problem formulations for language to deal with, um, you know, um, part of speech um, and, and um, grammar and, and syntax and semantics and all the rest of it. And recently, you know, things like GPT-3 have come along. Um, which have replaced all of those things with, with la viewing language as the solution to a common goal, which is predicting the next word in a large corpus of data. Um, and so that's really nice. Um, and I think a lot of the success of that approach is down to, to moving towards something which is a, a more common goal than we had before. Um, but it's not you know, a fully common goal in the sense that it's not moving all the way towards the thing which we actually care about. It's not, it's not moving towards like solving the problem that the end problem that the agent actually needs, like um, you know, minimizing its thirst or, or maximizing its cleanliness or, or um, maximizing the dollars that you make on the financial markets or whatever it is. Um, and so as a result, it may not produce a richer set of linguistic attributes, like where you have language being grounded into the actions and observations. So for example, you know, two agents that are carrying an awkward object between them, how is that going to emerge um, from a, a large corpus of data. Um, language may be situational and consequential and tailored to achieve a purpose. So for example, a salesperson uses language to maximize sales, a politician uses language to maximize votes, and they use language in different ways to achieve different ends because they're trying to achieve different things. Um, and so you know, we, we need to make sure that we have the ability for language to, to produce the end goals that we actually care about, that it can be um, tailored to those purposes. And the potential uses of language might actually outstrip the size of any corpus. I mean, there's 100 trillion words um, on the internet, but that might be small compared to the set of things we actually need to do with language. For example, you know, if you want to ask your, your language system how to control a new disease that you've never seen before, um, the, the answer to that question might not exist in your prior corpus, and you might need some um, interaction to be with, with your environment um, and some trial and error learning to follow a trajectory and interact with the environment to actually um, be able to identify the solution to such a problem. So the alternative is to view is to view language instead as emerging from a common goal of reward maximization. Um, you know, this is this is really then a common goal. It's saying, well, you know, whatever the end goal is, let's just 
define language as the set of utterances and comprehensions that the agent actually needs and uses in order to, to maximize its reward. Um, so in that sense, it's really just an extension of this idea that, that if an agent sees a, a danger warning sign, um, it has to be able to avoid, um, it has to learn that that warning sign means that it might be about to die. Um, and if it, if it utters a fetch command and, and it's brought some food, uh, it, it, these things are, are just necessary in order to actually for the agent to, to survive and, and not fall off the cliff and be able to, to receive its food. And, and if you just extend those concepts further, you, you end up with very rich attributes of, of, of language, of linguistic intelligence. For example, you know, a, um, a, a, a very much more sophisticated human-like agent might only be able to survive if it, if it can use language to, to understand where food is located, to negotiate for food, to build relationships with other agents in order to enhance those negotiations and, and get more food in the future. And if it's not able to use language effectively to achieve those ends, um, it will it will fail, um, and it will it it will not maximize reward. And so so language, in principle, must emerge from the maximization of of, of reward. Okay, so um, I just have a couple of minutes. I'm going to do some FAQs here um, before we get to the actual question questions. Um, so the first, maybe most important one is, you know, what else could be enough? So I've talked a lot about, about reward maximization being enough for intelligence, but, you know, couldn't it be the case that other things are, are enough for intelligence, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, evolution, offline learning, whatever. And, and I think it's clear that they can't. Um, so unsupervised learn doesn't have a goal for action selection. It doesn't tell you doesn't give you a mechanism for choosing one action over another. And so it, it can't be enough in itself for intelligent behavior. It might be part of intelligent behavior, and as such, it might be something which emerges in the service of, of, of maximizing reward, but it, it can't in itself be enough for intelligence. Um, supervised learning, well, it can be enough to um, achieve the goal that the teacher wants you to uh, uh, achieve, but it can only address um, the teacher's environment and the teacher's goal. And if you want to have an intelligence that can maximize other goals in other environments than the teacher's, well, you, supervised learning can't be enough. Um, what about you know, offline learning from a large data set, something like GPT-3? Um, well, you know, it, it seems like we can just make these data sets larger and larger and larger, and eventually they'll get vast enough that we can do everything we want. Um, but unfortunately, that won't work uh, because real problems are far larger than any data set. Like a really complex environment has solution trajectories in it that just have negligible probability in the data. And so the analogy to think of this is to think about, you know, what if we took a large data set, not from humans, but from something where it's more obvious that, that the data that's being generated doesn't contain the information we need. So imagine you took a huge data set of 100 million 100 trillion observations of chimps playing with Lego, um, would that be enough to tell you how to build a bridge? Well, um, the chimp, there's two problems. First of all, the chimp might not have had the goal of building a bridge. And so it's exceptionally unlikely that the chimp will have put things together in a way that actually contains the trajectories that you need to understand the, the physics of bridges and the dynamics of how they get put together. And furthermore, it might be the case that that the chimps are actually just not very good at achieving those goals. And so if that's true for chimps, it feels at least um, possible, plausible that that's true for humans as well, that we humans, um, if we want to do things other than the goals that the humans were actually doing in the observations we've seen, um, we may not have the data to be able to do it. And maybe humans weren't even actually that great at doing some of the things which we might ultimately be care about doing. Um, and what about evolution? Well. Natural intelligence, sure, natural intelligence emerged from maximizing a kind of fitness signal, um, but we want our AI to do so much more. We want artificial intelligence to, to optimize, you know, all of these different goals like, um, um, you know, um, customer satisfaction and, and, and retention and, and, and energy minimization and, um, and cleanliness and all of these things, um, battery use, all, all the rest of them. We want our AIs to be able to do all of these things. Um, and yeah, so 
we, we, we need something which has a flexible definition of, of objective. Okay, I've talked about this a little bit already, uh, so let me move on for time. Um, does the problem intelligence need us to design environments or rewards that induce intelligence? Like, is, is reward really enough if we have to go off and kind of design some special kind of simulator with some special goal, and it's only by optimizing that particular simulator and that particular goal that actually induces intelligence? Like, do we need to craft the environment or do we need to craft the reward? And if so, is that crafting part of the problem and can reward then be enough? Um, and so the thinking here is that, you know, the natural world is really just complex enough that we've seen this with natural intelligence, that animals, animal intelligence arose from, um, from, from the natural world because it was rich and, and complex and, and all kinds of things were going on in it. And so presumably artificial intelligence could also arise through, through these kind of interactions with the natural world or through a, compli a comparably complex artificial world like, you know, cities or, or the internet or, or whatever it is. And that in terms of the reward, well, that it should also be the case that there are many, many simple rewards co corresponding to the pragmatic application goals, just like animals might be optimizing for hunger or thirst or reproduction or whatever it is, that there are many, many simple rewards that, that our agents should follow. And the hypothesis is that, that there are just so many of these things that will, if you do really well on them, um, will give rise to all kinds of attributes of intelligence because the world is so complicated that the only way to succeed is to um, is, is to be smart, is to, you, you know, like you just have to be able to be smart to optimize even the simplest reward. Okay, and finally, is the problem of reward maximization too hard? Like, is it the case that efficient algorithms even exist? You know, don't we, isn't this really hard? Like, don't we need to simplify and approximate and abstract the problem? You know, isn't that what we do? You know, you, you're faced with this really, really hard problem. I'm telling you, look, deal with the real world, go out there, figure out algorithms, which if you if you solve that kind of problem could really lead to um, all kinds of attributes of intelligence really coming out of it. Isn't that just way too hard? Um, and, and I think I want to respond by saying, yeah, people have historically simplified and approximated and abstracted the problem, but in doing so, that might sidestep the challenges that we'll actually really need to face in order to make progress towards AGI. And so I at least choose to accept that challenge head on. Um, maybe, they, maybe there is no solution, but I'm determined to try because it, it, it's important because if we do this and if the hypothesis is correct or even approximately correct that, that many or most attributes of intelligence will emerge from the pursuit of, of reward maximization, then let's, focus on solving that problem, because if we do, then, then we, we solve AI, and that's a big deal. And so I hope you'll join us on this quest. It's an exciting quest. I think it's the, the, the quest of our time. Um, thank you.